If there's a question that I or other YouTubers get asked a lot and try to answer more than any other, it's variations of what is the best watch at X price point. 5,000, 1,500, 4,000, 20,000 dollars. People go online and try to make sense of all the options out there. They don't want to feel that they made a bad decision and that's how these simple lists end up getting made. As far as I'm concerned though, there's no such thing as best or best value and me saying this watch is better than that watch is not really useful. What I do think is interesting is talking about how watches differentiate at these price points, what's important to have front and center as a buyer and what to know but not stress out too much about. And even more so, why at these specific price points you are mostly getting a reasonably good watch regardless of what you're buying. So check your bank account because we are looking at watches at 500, $1,500 and $4,000 today and how to figure out for yourself if you're getting a good watch for the price. Let's dive in. I've chosen these three price points because I think they illustrate really well what happens in terms of quality and features as you go up in price. Comparing watches at these price points, it's typically a lot easier to match the watch to a given price point than it is at eight or 12 or $20,000. The gap between four and 12,000 is much smaller than the gap between 500 and 4,000. These price points are also interesting because they have a huge mix of well-known brands like Seiko, Tissot, Longines, but also lesser broadly known brands like Baltic or Christopher Ward or Formex. What do you get at $500 or less? To answer that question, you have to be mindful that this is whether you like it or not for most watches on the cheap side of things. Sure, $500 isn't cheap, but this is a hobby where brands like Rolex sell 1.2 million watches at an average price of $13,500. In that context, $500 is relatively speaking cheap. When you as a manufacturer have to produce something that cheap, you have to compromise on some things. Whether we like it or not, a watch at $500 is not going to be nearly as solid and refined as an $8,000 watch. There are going to be compromises. First of all, below $500, you are going to see a lot of quartz watches. Quartz movements are by far the cheapest to produce and install into your case. Weirdly, they are typically very accurate, but from a manufacturing perspective, they are very, very cheap, so they contribute to keeping your price point down. Is quartz worse? Well, mechanical is deemed to be cooler and more luxurious, but in all honesty, I think we sometimes overstate the importance of mechanical movements. The closer though that you get to $500, the less likely it will be that the watches are quartz. They're generally likely to be mechanical, where under 250, they're more likely to be quartz. Depending on the type of watch you get, they are generally going to be less refined. You'll see this in a lot of different ways. Dress watches in this space are typically very basic. The dials are going to be a little bit more flat with a little bit fewer details, less features in terms of applied markers, sunray dials, those kind of things, at least compared to high end offerings. Dive watches are typically going to be a little bit more on the chunky side. They will come across often, but not always as a bit larger or thicker. Cases are not always going to be as sharp or well polished as high end offerings. But again, closer to $500, dive watches will be more common because they are more expensive to build because of the bezels and the depth ratings and other requirements where dressier watches can tend to be at a lower price point, especially when there's not a steel bracelet, which also adds to the cost. For divers, specs are not going to be in the extreme end. It's not often that you'll find 300 meters of water resistance. 200 or 100 will be more common. Bezels will be stamped instead of machined and text on the bezels might not always line up. Rotating bezels will feel a little bit clunky and it's not unlikely that there will be a little bit of play in the mechanism. That precision that you get from your Submariner is not going to be there. On the dress watches, a date window and the date text might not be perfectly centered and the markers will sometimes in the right light seem a little bit tinny. The metals will just look a little bit thinner, it will look a little bit less robust, and again, this is compared to high-end offerings. Bracelets are going to be fine, but they will sound a little bit thin, they'll often have a bit of a rattle to them compared to the next price ranges. Generally, I think, and this is a controversial statement, but watches in this price point are generally not built to last forever. I have watches in this price range like a Seiko Cocktail Time JDM which I've had for a very long time. The watches can potentially last forever in your hands, but mostly they are from the manufacturer's perspective. 
built with a limited lifespan in mind and the manufacturing decisions that go into it reflect that. This is also the reason why you see a ton of fashion watches in the space. Fashion watches are disposable in their very nature. Daniel Wellington came and went. The design language that they had was popular and then it died, thankfully. What would I avoid? Well, in this price range, I avoid fashion watches, but not for the reason you think. Like I said, quartz movements are everywhere in the space, and I'd go so far as to say that a quartz movement in a Daniel Wellington is not going to be orders of magnitude worse than a quartz movement in a Timex. The whole point of quartz is that it's cheap and accurate. So in this price point, that's not the differentiator. I avoid fashion watches for two reasons. Most fashion watches from brands like Daniel Wellington, Michael Kors and the like, they are lazy in design. Go to any fashion watch site and they'll either have exactly one watch design in 300 size and strap variations. That's the Daniel Wellington model. Or you'll have the Michael Kors make it look kind of sort of like more popular name brand designs, but not really. Or you'll just have other brands that just scream that they called someone in China and said, we need 70 watches, just make them all different so people have options. Everything at this price point, well, at all price points, but at this price point is a compromise. But I think a couple of watches illustrate this really well. Take the Timex Weekender against the Tissot PRX. Both are essentially integrated sports watches. Both look very good. The PRX costs closer to $500 and the Timex is closer to $250, so about half the price. Both have a quartz movement. The Tissot movement might be a little bit better than the Ronde and the Timex, but honestly, it's quartz, so it's going to be fine. If you just look at the movement, the Tissot is going to be considered as the high end of the price range. Most other watches that get close to the $500 mark are going to be mechanical. But Tissot chose to upgrade on the dial. They chose to upgrade on the crystal, which is sapphire. They chose to upgrade on the case. They chose to throw their money at those visual cues that make for a watch that build quality wise comes off as a lot more premium than most watches at $500. But they had to compromise on the movement. You can also look at the Timex Marlin and the Seiko Presage. I like both. Both are dressy watches, but what are the things that are driving the price up or down? It's the 200 meters of water resistance in the Seiko. It's the steel bracelet of the Seiko. It's the movement of the Seiko. But apart from that, they're very, very comparable. Okay, $1,500. We are starting to get into the range of real money. Again, said in the context of a hobby that can potentially cost you millions of dollars. What changes from $500? A lot, as in tons. First of all, at $1,500, these watches are potentially built to last forever. I said that $500 was not a price point where an infinite lifespan was part of the build criteria, but at $1,500, many people will expect this watch to be able to last forever if they want it to. This is going to drive up manufacturing costs. Things need to be serviceable, they need to be more robust, and that bit more solid overall in terms of fit and finish. Second, at $1,500, you are delivering a watch that most people will define as some sort of luxury item. This means that the watch has to feel and look premium. Also, as buyers, manufacturers have conditioned us to believe that a watch at this price should have a mechanical movement. Instead of going through the whole, what's the difference between $500 and $1,500, we can keep it a bit brief and just go with the logic that the closer you get to $1,500, the more quality you should get. In this overall price range, features and price go up fairly much in parallel. You're still not in the price range where any particular brand can ask a premium because of their name on the dial. There are good brands in the space, but they don't command a premium for their name yet. I'd even go so far as to say that the opposite is true. Seiko is not a brand that in this space as yet tries to sell themselves as luxury. Christopher Ward, Formex, Monta, they are all brands that very openly state on their websites that their primary goal is to offer some variant of value for money. They try very hard to say, ignore the brands, just look at how good our watches are. This is super, super prevalent in this space. So what do you get at almost exactly $1,500? You get a Christopher Ward C63 Sealander GMT. You get a Seiko SPB143. You get a Zin 556. And this is where it gets interesting. What's the movement in the Oris? Salita. The movement in the Christopher Ward? Salita. The Zin? Salita. And Seiko, they have their own movement. 
but let's look at specs. Aorus, 200 meters of depth, 38 hours of power reserve. Zinn, 38 hours, 200 meters. Seiko, 70 hours, 200 meters. Christopher Ward, 50, 60-ish hours, 150 meters. The Seiko technically stands out with 70 hours of power reserve, but Seiko typically doesn't have great accuracy and it beats at a lower beat rate. Then there's the CW, it has a GMT function, but sort of the key point here is that they're all incredibly similar. In this price range, watches are not only similar, but often you'll hit a Salita movement if it's not a Swatch brand manufacturer that uses ETA movements. This price point is ridiculously competitive, so most watches are going to be incredibly similar in terms of specs. There are tons of reasons for this. They use the same consultants, the manufacturers use the same market research, and that implies that most of these brands have the insight into what is important to buyers. People believe that a mechanical movement should be in that case. People want to see a reasonably good bracelet. People want a bezel to align properly and feel it's more precise. A dial shouldn't feel plasticky or tinny. And as a result, from an overall specification perspective, most of the brands will tend to converge on the same core specifications. Differentiation in terms of specifications is not the key at this price point. The differentiation is the design, and the specs are just living up to more or less what people expect for the price, and the margins are not going to be huge relative to other price ranges. Watches in this space also tend to be samey for another reason, and that's the democratization of production. It's a fancy way of saying pretty much anybody can set up shop and source a decent case, a decent bracelet, and a decent dial with very little effort. Brands like Monta and Christopher Ward are extremely open about this. In interviews, their CEOs and design heads have basically said that they can source parts for their watches that are of the same quality as parts that go into watches that are many times more expensive than their own watches. And directionally, it's true. There are some notable exceptions to this, where at $500 and below, I said that you should avoid fashion watches. There's a different thing to be aware of here, and that's that at this price point, name brands, so Tag Heuer, for example, will tend to not always be as good as the lesser known brands, at least for some of their models. A Tag Heuer Formula One is a very nice watch, but at close to $1,500, it has a quartz movement and it's on a rubber strap. Baum and Mercier do this as well. Longines does this as well. Longines have the Hydro Conquest at 41 millimeters with a quartz movement at just over $1,000 and I think about $1,500 for the mechanical versions. It's not that the name brands generally overcharge, that's not the case, but often there will be a quartz version of a watch that really isn't that compelling and its lower price compared to the mechanical is basically just to illustrate options, but I would generally avoid those quartz models. And if we stick with the Longines Hydro Conquest, Sure, it has 72 hours of power reserve, but largely the build quality of that watch compared to a Christopher Ward or a Monte is going to be very similar. Because as I've said, at $1,500 specs and features will tend to be very similar because they are not key to the buying decision for the general watch buyer, which likely aren't watch enthusiasts. And everything can be sourced from the same parts manufacturers. Finally, we get to $4,000. Who sells a watch for between $1,500 and $4,000? You can get a Longines Spirit Zulu Time GMT in 39 millimeters for about $3,000. A Tudor Ranger on a strap is around $3,000. A Yema Superman Slim for $2,500. Nomos has a Club Sport for $3,700. Grand Seiko has a Blue Snowflake with quartz movement for $3,800. You can get a Cartier Tank for less than $4,000. What happens between $1,500 and $4,000 is, to me at least, super interesting. Below $500, it's all about compromises. Up to $1,500, most watches spec-wise tend to become very similar. Margins are likely not huge, so optimization is the name of the game, and the key to differentiation is, to a large extent, the actual look of the watch. Specs and quality converge at around $1,500, give or take at least. But above $1,500, there's definitely more room for margins. This is where watch brands really start to rake in the cash. It's not as much as Rolex, but this is where margins kick in. And another thing that kicks in is the need to justify the price premium. At $1,500, there are a lot of brands trying to communicate value for money. This is an argument that's largely non-existent above that point. Case in point, Yammer. 
At 2,500, they want you to believe that there's CMM 2.0 in-house movement and a scale bracelet and a thinner case, or what justify the higher price point. Tudor has also gone fully in-house. This is, of course, in part to have full control of the production process, complete control over quality and also scale benefits, but they also use it very actively to try and convince people that their watches are more accurate, more durable, and have more power, and that that's worth paying more for. Seiko take it in a completely different direction and basically say, you're paying for the dial. Nomos too is in-house, but only with 38 hours of power reserve, whereas Longines and Tudor and others offer 70 hours or more. Nomos goes for simplicity in their designs and they are very much trying to offer something that design-wise is very visually distinct from your standard Swiss watch fare, like a Longines Spirit or a Black Bay 36. They offer a visually distinct alternative at an incredibly competitive price point. That differentiation though comes with a price. Some people will see it as a negative. Is it reliable? Is it accurate? Can I service it? They're all valid questions. Seiko do the same. At this price point, you are in the limited edition territory with models like the SJE093. Above $3,000, Seiko is very clearly speaking to their absolute most diehard fans. Their bread and butter watches are the sub $1,500 watches, but when you buy that limited edition SJE093 62MAS reinterpretation with a better case, a better dial, a better bezel, and a better movement, you are not a regular watch buyer. You are not a regular Seiko buyer. You are an enthusiast, and that's their differentiation at this price point. Similarly, not everyone is going to care about Tudor. Opinions on price and value are strong everywhere, but I would make an argument that in and around this price point, people can have incredibly strong opinions as to the perception of value. A Longines Spirit Zulu Time GMT at just over $3,100 and a Tudor Black Bay Pro at just under $4,000 on a strap. Is the Tudor objectively 25% better? They're both GMTs. They're both incredibly well finished. The Black Bay Pro is a bit slap-sided on account of the movement. But is the Black Bay Pro, in my opinion, put better together overall? I'd say yes. But back to the question, is it put 25 or 30% better together? Probably not. So why the premium? Because Tudor can. Over $1,500, the logo on the dial plays a massive part. Tudor are very good watches, but like for like, I don't believe they consistently are 25 or 30% better than a comparable Longines. A Cartier Tank Must is a beautiful watch, but at $3,300, $3,400 for a quartz movement on a leather strap with 30 meters of water resistance, you're from a specification perspective objectively getting ripped off. That's the power of brands. Tudor is playing the specs game. Everything is COSC certified and more and more is going Metas, although that's mostly in models about $4,000. And Cartier, they could care less about movements and Metas and depth ratings. You are in a space where you are paying for the perceived value of the brand and you are going to like some brands a lot while others will not resonate with you at all. And you'll meet people that have incredibly strong opinions about all brands. That's also the case for all price points, but just as the manufacturers differentiate here, so do consumers. Longines needs to feel different from Tudor. Cartier needs to feel different from whoever they are competing at. I actually think that's why they do so well, because I'm not sure they're competing with anybody. They're just so dominant in the way they position themselves. Some people will find the Seiko SJE selling points wholly unconvincing, but to those enthusiasts, those watches are the best things since sliced bread. One other thing that happens on your way to $4,000 is that the number of lesser known brands thins out. Zinn disappears after $3,000, Formex, Monta, all those smaller brands top out below $2,500 and aren't really replaced by others. New brands, independent brands, don't really start to show up again until you get into the really high end. It's not like there aren't options in this space, but largely this is the Tudor Longine Oris Tag Heuer space. It's the household name brand space. The reason isn't all that complicated. Your brand matters in this space and the amount of money you need to spend to establish yourself as a brand where your brand in and of itself is a selling point is massively expensive. That's why Monta, Christopher Ward and all the others play just below this price point. That's where the lack of brand appreciation isn't a negative. Could they get into this brand space someday? Absolutely. Do they want to? 
Sure, why wouldn't they? There's definitely more money to be made in this space, but the key for this price range is the differentiation because with that differentiation comes more profit and more customer loyalty. Manufacturers like that because who doesn't want a customer that will potentially come back for more? And it's not that they are only watch enthusiast brands, but these are brands that regular people will go back to when their old watch breaks or gets stolen, or they'll just recommend that brand to someone else. I'm not a cynic at all. I'm generally of the opinion that most watch manufacturers in the sub 500, sub 1500 and sub 4000 price range make good watches for the price with a quality that matches the price reasonably well. I don't think there's a massive risk of hitting a brand where quality control issues are the norm with the brand risks going out of business any minute and you'll be left with an unserviceable watch. Most brands at all these price points are going to be pretty good and pretty similar to comparable offerings. That's why the whole best thing doesn't really resonate with me. It also doesn't resonate with me because best implies some sort of objectivity. That might be the case for a mass spectrometer. You buy it entirely for its precision and its technical features, but you don't buy a watch purely because of its depth rating. Sure, some people will flatly refuse to buy a watch with under 100 meters of water resistance, and that's fine. Some people will also insist on a minimum of 60 hours of power reserve. Some people will refuse a watch that's over 14 millimeters thick, and others would never ever touch any watch with an ETA powermatic movement in it. And that's fine, that's their choice. But the reality is most people choose a watch because they like the looks of it. They like the way it makes them feel. It reminds them of something special, a child's birthday, a wedding, graduation and claiming that one watch is superior to another is just irrelevant and yeah a four thousand dollar watch is going to have features and specifications that are superior to those of a five hundred dollar watch but that doesn't make it better and yes some four thousand dollar watches are not featured and specced out in a way that they are precisely 25 percent better despite being 25 percent more expensive than a similar product from another brand but it doesn't make it better for you at $500, you get a good watch. It's not built to last forever. You can get a more solid case of design, but the movement will be a little bit worse. Or you can get a nicer movement and compromise on the other specs. Both are good. One will be better for you. At $1,500, all watches are going to be spec-wise very similar. That's not a bad thing. It's just the nature of market convergence and a whole lot of other things. Don't be so busy with arguing with others that this Aorus is better than that Christopher Ward or that Formex does something better than the Monta. From model to model, some things will be superior on one brand model and be inferior on other characteristics of that model. But I do believe you can confidently say you are going to get a solid good watch for the most part. This is probably where someone in the comments will write, no, no, there's a crappy brand that I don't understand. You didn't call out because they are total junk and therefore totally invalidates your argument. Or someone will write, actually, I have this and this brand that you mentioned and I had a terrible experience with them. Sure, it happens and there are brands like that, but generally not. I do see them as the exception. And up to $4,000 the watches get more solid. They are specced very well, generally speaking, but brands differentiate. And most importantly, this is really where you start buying the brand. That logo has a price. It's not either or. It's not like there isn't a substantially good product under the hood, but there is a price you pay for the Cartier or Seiko or Tudor logo. And both regular consumers and enthusiasts will have strong opinions about that logo on their watch and maybe on the logo on your watch as well. You're not going to get cheated, at least not if you avoid those fashion watches. You'll get a watch that is more or less reasonably priced compared to its competitors. You just choose the one that resonates with you. And that's why I own this watch. A Swatch Hurst Mickey Mouse Collectible. It's one of my best watches. It's best for me, despite the loud ticking noise and all the other faults of a Swatch. What's your best watch? Let me know in the comments. Like, subscribe. Cheers.